Okay. Yes, I am. I'm currently waitlisted in this class. Um, how does that mean? So the um, so usually I try my best to accommodate, especially for you know, this a grad course. And so I know you guys' options are limited. Yeah. And so what I do is that by the end of the week, for everyone that's on the waitlist, if it's not if it's not crazy, if it's not like twenty people on the waitlist, mm -hmm. I usually just let everyone. Get on the class. So just just stay on the waitlist for now, because usually people kind of move around yeah. kind of naturally. And so you know the way the way it usually works is that we have to go and kind of increase. The number of seats in the course mm -hmm. and so i don't want to do that kind of prematurely so usually by the end of the first week people know if they want to get there or not so oh. yeah so just stay on the wait list you know I'll, I'll, at the end of the week i'll see who's there mm -hmm. if it's like you know four or five people so yeah everyone just increase i'll, I'll tell the department just increase the seats by five oh. the only thing we may the only issue we may run into is that uh is just the physical capacity of this, of this room oh. and so we need to make sure that there's enough seats for mm -hmm. everyone in this room okay. um but i think the capacity is like 30, it's almost 40 in this course. So okay. usually not an issue because there's not too many of you guys. Right. So if you're first, I would say that's the case. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, of course. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, how's it going? Going well.
I don't know, but I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a sand. There's a sand on the table. Oh, look, 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 can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes the sound doesn't go through, so you got you got to check it. It's good. Um, I appreciate you um, having the option to attend virtually, sir. I live very far away from campus, so I greatly appreciate it, though I will participate. Oh, for sure, for sure. No, it's, you, sir. Yeah, it's something I've been doing for a while, and, and students seem to like it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do it. So I think, I think it gives people a lot of flexibility. Um, I'll talk about it later today, too. In my opinion, um, in my opinion with, the, with the virtual option and the videos recorded, uh, assuming you're a fair professor, there's really no no reason for us to fail with all that, uh, all these tools, assuming the assignments are fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think it's uh, you know technology is changing, and I think we should uh, we should make use of it. Thank you. 
All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. All right, so my name is Justin. Uh, I am the instructor for this course, and this course is EGME 540, uh, Computer Applications and Engineering Design. Long ass name, but you know we'll talk about what this course is about uh, today. Okay. Uh, so the plan for today, you know, it's, it's just the first day. You know, it's the first day after you know New Year's and Christmas and everything. So you know, we're not. I mostly I'm just planning on going over the syllabus, um, introducing what this course is about, just so that you have an idea what you can expect from this course, uh, and then going over the course website as well. So just mostly just administrative stuff and just um, you know going over um, you know. Just, just a general overview of the course, and then on Wednesday when we meet, uh, we'll kind of jump, we'll kind of jump right into it. And so you know, today, you know, the first day is always, you know, um, I think everyone's still kind of getting, getting used to coming back, and so you know, I didn't want to do anything, uh, you know, too heavy, so that's kind of. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions on on anything before I get started for today? Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so who am I? So my name is uh, Professor Justin Tram. So uh, you can call me whatever you want. And you know, what I usually tell people is that if it's comfortable for you to call me something, then it's comfortable for me. Okay, so I, you know, people call me Professor. People call me Justin. Um, I, I put this offer out there every semester, and so you know, I grew up um, in the era of online gaming, and so I'm I'm no stranger to people calling me all kinds of nasty things online, and so you know, it doesn't it doesn't phase me. That's the only thing. So, you know, I would put this out there. So if you want, you know, you can address me like, you know, hey, dick face, and then I will, I will respond to that. You know, as long as you're, as long as you're saying with some modicum of respect, it's somewhat kidding, not, not, you don't have any malice behind it, then that's, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's a name, it's a name. And so, you know, as long as I know that you're talking to me and there's some kind of respect there, that's, that's all that I care about. All right. So email address, um, you know, I think that's uh, important because, you know, I know a lot of our communication for, you know, for a lot of us going to be through email. So my email address is easy to remember. And so it's uh, just ran at fortune.edu. And so you just think about, you know, I just ran a mile or I just ran to class. That is my email address. So just ran at fortune.edu. Okay. Um, so I grew up around here. So my hometown is Cypress, California. And so if you're not, you don't know where that is, that's just about eight to 10 miles west of here, uh, down the 91 west. Okay. Uh, so Fortin is an area that I, you know, I'm very familiar with. I'm very happy to work here just because my family is over there. Um, I actually just saw them over the weekend from Lunar New Year, so you know I'm you know very happy to, to be here. Okay. A bit about my background: so I got my bachelor's at UCLA, my master's at UCSD, uh, PhD at Stanford, all of it in mechanical engineering. And so you know I've seen you know, different mechanical engineering departments, and you know very familiar with the curriculums at all these places. And so you know I'm kind of kind of boring in that sense. I'm kind of just working in the same kind of environment my whole life, basically. Okay. And my research interest is that um, have a lot to do with this class, actually. So uh, what I'm interested in, in is uh, applications of specifically computational tools, things like finite elements, uh, finite volumes, computational fluid dynamics, and applying those tools for studying heart and blood disease. And so um, a lot of my work has, uh, has been in, you know, how can we use CFD to study um, things like atherosclerosis or plaque disease and plaque buildup inside the human body. Um, and just naturally, just as an instructor in, uh, in in engineering, I'm always interested in you know how can we better teach uh, the courses and how can we make them more effective for students. Okay. All right, uh, learning objectives. And so this is uh, something that you'll see every day. And so one thing that you'll see kind of before we start is that I like to list out uh, what I call the learning objectives for the day. Okay. 
And so you can almost think of these as kind of like an outline of what we plan to cover for the day. Uh, but I write them in a very particular way. So if you kind of notice every, um, every bullet point here, it starts with a verb. And so the reason for that is that, you know, each of those verbs kind of describes something that you should be able to do, okay? So my goal with every lecture is that, you know, here are the things that I want you to be able to do by the end of lecture. And then, you know, if you go through the lecture, you pay attention, you, you take notes, you should be able to do those things, okay? And so for instance, the first learning objective here is to describe the use and utility of finite elements in engineering work, okay? By the end of today, you know, if, uh, if you know, if I ambush you at your car in the parking lot, I say, hey, describe to me the use and utility of finite elements, you should be able to tell me, okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going straight home after this because it's freaking late, but, you know, that's, that's kind of the goal. And so the reason I do this is because um, not, not ambushing people, you know, the reason I kind of write the, the learning objectives the way they do um, is I want you guys to be able to have a way to kind of almost like self-assess yourself. And so, you know, you come to class or you view the class on Zoom, you write down the learning objectives, and then after class is over, you go back to the learning objectives and see, you know, am I able to do these things that was one of the objectives for today? And if the answer is yes, then that's good. Then you got, you know, an important part of the lecture today. If not, then, you know, maybe it's a good idea to go back, watch the lecture recording, or maybe talk to me, um, come to office hours, and we can kind of clear that up, okay? Um, and I think this is kind of a good way to kind of organize just a class in general, just because, you know, um, I'd say nowadays, you know, students are becoming more and more busy. So you, you want to make sure that if you're coming to class, it should be worth it. So, you know, I want to kind of give you these learning objectives so that if you come to class, you should be able to do these specific things after the course. And so that's kind of why I, I have this, okay? So you'll see these a lot. You'll see this at the beginning of lecture every day. And so I always tell people it's a good idea to write them down each day. Um, today, you don't have to do it just because, you know, it's just the introduction day, you know, but starting Wednesday and, and, and all throughout, you know, write them at the top of your notes. And so, you know, um, by the end of the day, you go back in your notes, you look at your learning objectives and you kind of see if you got everything you, um, I wanted you to get from that lecture, okay? Okay, um, so let's talk about this course. And so, you know, I know, I know the name of the course is a little bit um, general and that's on purpose because, uh, you know, um, the way the graduate courses here are is that it, it kind of, the, the content of the course kind of depends on who's teaching it. Um, so we kind of leave it a little general on purpose, but for myself, um, a lot of my expertise is in finite element modeling. So I'm gonna teach this course um, with that in mind. Okay? So that means ANSYS, a lot of ANSYS, um, and we're gonna be learning how to use it at, you know, at a professional level, okay? And so if you're not familiar with FEA or finite element analysis, basically FEA is a numerical technique um, for solving differential equations on arbitrary geometries. Okay? And so the idea is that it's, uh, it's a computational or numerical technique and that we're gonna set up problems in a way that we can leverage kind of the, the computational power of computers to perform all the calculations that we need to, you know, much faster than humans, okay? And ultimately what this allows us to do is that it allows us to make uh, what I call predictive models, okay? Because uh, a lot of times, you know, you're working on design, you're working on something, and you wanna see, you know, how your geometry or how your design is gonna to react to a certain load. And so if you put like a hundred pound load on your structure, you wanna make sure that it's not gonna break, that it's not gonna to deform too much, okay? And so uh, what allows us to do that is predictive models, which is what FEA allows us to do, okay? And so that's, that's kind of the general idea. So, you know, we'll talk about this, you know, a bit more today, but, you know, we're replacing kind of the need, we're not replacing it, but, you know, we're, we're kind of having an alternate way to perform experiments, to perform tests using a computer. So it kind of saves us a lot of time and a lot of resources, okay? Um, and this is really important for practical engineering systems because, you know, what you'll find and probably what a lot of you already know, because I know a lot of you guys are working at the same time too, is that real kind of, you know, practical engineering systems have situations that are very complex. You know, the geometry is very complex. Um, the loading or the boundary conditions are very complex. And so it's very hard to perform hand calculations on that because you can't really simplify it in a way that makes the calculations doable, okay? And so in those situations, if you want to do some kind of predictive modeling, you need to have computers to do it. And so this class is all about, you know, how can we use computer software, uh, specifically ANSYS to do this kind of, of model? Okay. Um, any questions uh, so far? Um, I do have one, if no one in the classroom has one. Sure, go ahead, Evan. Um, so Dr. Chan, um, when did you start learning FEA? Uh, was it during your undergrad, uh, your master's or your a PhD? Oh, it's a good question. I, I didn't actually start using it until graduate school. And so I started oh, in my, my first quarter of my master's studies. 
Um, I didn't take it as an undergrad. And so, um, you know, because I know a lot of, a lot of, I mean, you guys are all grad students, you're taking this course. And so if this is your first experience with FDA. I'd say that's pretty normal for a lot of people. So um, um, I'll go ahead. So that was my first question. I had another question that, oh, oh um, and what gained your interest? Did you just take a class in FEA and that started yeah. everything or? I was in, I mean, I was interested in the idea of simulations. And so just, uh, you know, okay. being able to predict in, in a computer what's going to happen. And so, you know, and F F FEA is, is one of the most common methods for, for doing that. And so. Yeah, for solid um, mechanics. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's even yeah. used for like heat transfer and for fluid um, stuff too as well. So we'll, we'll touch on that. And, a and last question, and this last question may be redundant, but I just want to uh, understand. Um, sure. So if, if we need help with anything throughout the course, can we email you, whether it be the assignments or the theories? Of course. Yeah, Perfect. Of course. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah we'll you, talk sir. about it you know, later when we're doing the syllabus. But yeah, email is probably one of the best ways to reach me, if not you know, in the lecture or office hours. But you know, I, try, I try to be very responsive on emails. Um, if I see it and I'm- Thank you, sir. Uh, if I'm not at home, then I'll probably respond to you the same day, but if not, the next day for sure. Sounds good. All right, so let's dive into the types of analysis. And so we just talked about you know, how FEA is a computer method, um, but there's other ways that you can perform analysis or design, uh, or design parts, okay? And so the first type of um, analysis that I wanna go over is called, I call it analytical, okay? And these are kind of the traditional kind of pencil and paper type of calculations. And so. You know, if you take a class in like solid mechanics or fluid mechanics heat transfer, this is probably what you're familiar with. And so you're given a problem on paper and you solve the equations, you know, on, on paper, okay? Um, so obviously, of course, this is very cheap because, you know, a piece of paper is, is cheap, although, you know, more expensive now with inflation, pencil is, is you know, rising up there a little bit too. Um, but, you know, because of the limitations of, you know, how much you can do just by hand, just as a human, um, analytical is really only useful for simple problems. Um, if you do anything kind of complex with the geometry or the loading, you really kind of have to do something else. Okay. All right, so the, the second type of analysis that we have is called uh, ex experimental. Um, and so it's for, these are for cases where, you know, you have a situation that's too complex to do by hand, um, but you still want to get some data. So, you know, usually the best way to find out is just to try it out. Okay. And so you can, this means to either run an experiment or to run some kind of test, uh, um, some kind of test uh, facility. Okay. Uh, so, for instance, you know, if you're if you're designing cars, you know, uh, one thing that's often done is uh, is crash testing. Okay, and so if you want to see if your if your if the car that you're designing can withstand, you know, a 50 mile an hour uh, impact, then the best way to find out is to build a car and just run it into a wall at 50 miles an hour. Okay, then you will know for sure if the system can uh, can withstand that um, because it happens. Okay, and so I would say experimental. There's 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 no way. I kind of misspoke earlier when I say that FEA can replace this. We're never going to replace experiments um, because experiments are always going to have the best best data. Okay, um, but of course, you know the kind of the downsides of using experiments is that it's very costly. You have to build a whole freaking car, and it's very time consuming. So you have to kind of set up the test rig and you know, collect the data and all that stuff. So you know nowadays, kind of the cutting edge is to you know you still need to do some experiments if you're doing design, but to try to limit the amount of experiments that you do. To kind of make sure that you're, you know, you're producing designs in a costly manner, in a in a cost efficient manner, in a, with a time efficient manner. Okay, and so that's where computers come in. So the last type of analysis that we have is called computational. Okay, and so it it bears a lot of similarities with analytical because in that you know at the end of the day we're trying to solve equations, uh, specifically differential equations. But instead of you performing the calculations, we set up the problem in a way that the computer's going to do the calculations for you. Okay. And of course, that's going to produce, you know, a solution that is, you know, much faster than what you can do as a human. Okay. And so kind of the, the upside for computational is that, you know, you can handle very complex cases. Um, granted, your computer's powerful enough, um, but it can also be tricky to set up. And in fact, you know, I think the thing that kind of tricks people the most about using computational is that it's not immediately clear all the times when you get like a, like a bad result or an inaccurate result. Um, and so part of this class is going to be, you know, a big part of this class is, you know, learning how do we properly set up these kind of computational problems? How do we properly set up the FDA? But also, you know, when things don't go well, you know, how do you, how do you diagnose that? How do you know when things aren't going well? And what do you do from there? Okay. Yeah. Um, you need a decent, you need a decent computer um, 
to, to run ANSYS. Um, there is a student, a free student version of ANSYS that's available. Um, I haven't run into any issues in the past. So I, I've taught, I've taught finite elements for, you know, four years now. And, and, and for the most part, no one's had an issue with it. Also because, you know, all the ANSYS is installed on these computers here. And so, um, you know, worst case, you can, you can do all the projects and assignments in, in the lab as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it run on Mac? It does not. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you need a Windows. And so that's, that's where the lab is going to come in, come in here because, you know, all these computers run Windows and they all run ANSYS uh, pretty well. In fact, we just replaced all the computers in here. So they should be brand spanking new. So it should be, it should be good. Any other questions on, on this? Okay, so let's do some examples. And so, um, um, so let's, let's think about a beam for a second. Okay, so a beam is the structural member that's meant to hold and load on top. Okay, so here we have a beam with kind of a distributed load on top. Um, and so if you have a simple case like this, so this is a simply supported beam. Um, this is something that you can solve by, by hand. Okay, but if you were to do something more complex, like you're designing a whole ass building, um, this is a lot more difficult to do with pan calculation, especially when you look at kind of the, the intersections of where a lot of the beams are meeting. Um, that's very complex. And so you're going to need to have some kind of computational tool to help you out with, with that. All right, so let's look at a heat transfer situation. So this is a, this is a very simple case. And so we have basically a, rectang a rectangular block uh, with two different temperatures. And so, you know, you maybe you could think of this as like, uh, you know, the inside and outside of your car on a cold day. Okay. And so uh, in this kind of simple case, you can solve the heat equation and you can find out how the temperature varies inside this rectangular block, okay? Um, but if you wanna do something more complex, you know, like say this is, a, uh, this is a turbine blade, okay? And so if this turbine blade were inside, say like an aircraft engine, and you wanted to find out, you know, as the hot gases are kind of flowing past the blade and as it's rotating, you wanna find out if your blade is gonna melt or not. Um, that's something that's very difficult to do with hand calculation. So you have to kind of rely on computers uh, to help you out in situations like this. Okay. Uh, and then finally, one example from fluid mechanics, just because my own background is fluid mechanics. And so here we have a simple pipe flow. And so we have flow in a cylindrical pipe where we have a higher pressure on the left, lower pressure on the right. The flow is going to go from the higher pressure to the low pressure. And in this simple case, we can solve the Navier-Stokes equations for this velocity profile here. Um, but if you wanted to solve, if you wanted to solve something more complex, uh, so this is so this is work that's done uh, by one of my my, my colleagues, um, and so this is a surgical geometry. So this is this is actually a little kid, and uh, you know he has a uh, what we call a single ventricle, so only a single heart. And so to kind of help the heart kind of uh, pump, what we've done, what he's done is he's basically built a conduit from um, this blood vessel on the right here, which is higher pressure, to this blood vessel on the left, which is lower pressure. And this pressure difference can kind of help kind of pump the blood throughout the body. Okay? Um, and because the geometry here is a lot more complex, you know, we have to rely on simulations in order to, to do it. Okay. So those are the types of problems that we're going to be looking at in this class. Um, so problems that, you know, um, you, may be, you may be able to do an approximation by hand, but really if you, if you wanted to get quantitative numbers in terms of, you know, actual data, uh, deformation, stress, then you need to run a simulation. Okay, uh, and of course, you know, you can think of a lot of other examples as well. And so I know a lot of you are coming from, you know, you guys are coming from, uh, from industry. And so I'm sure there's a lot of applications that you can think of, you know, in your, uh, in your job or maybe in projects that you've seen that, that we, you can use simulations for as well. Or maybe simulations are already being used. Okay, okay. and so with that, um, you know, I will say that uh, on Wednesday, we are gonna really hit the ground running. And so on, on Wednesday, we're gonna be doing our first activity in ANSYS, okay? And so if you're not familiar with ANSYS, ANSYS is uh, one of the most common uh, commercial softwares for FEA, okay? Uh, we like it a lot because they have a free license and so we can download it without uh, breaking any laws, which is usually a good thing, okay? Um, but there's a lot out there as well. And so uh, you may have heard of software called Abacus, you've heard of software, uh, even SolidWorks is kind of getting in the game right now. So there's SolidWorks simulation, okay? Um, so there's a lot of softwares. And so you may, you may be asking, you know, why are we using ANSYS? Um, the choice of ANSYS itself isn't, I would say is not as important because what we're gonna be focusing on in this class is what I call kind of the finite element process, okay? Because no matter which software that you're using, you kind of follow the same process to set up a finite element simulation, which I can kind of broadly, um, you know, 
um, kind of organized into those six steps. Okay. And so what you'll see is that, you know, um, if you kind of learn one software and you kind of know what you need to do for each step, um, the only thing that really changes between each of the different softwares is just where the buttons are and what they're called. Okay. And so we're going to be focusing, you know, I mean, of course, we're going to be using ANSYS for all this, but we're going to be focusing a lot on this process. Because I, what I'm hoping is that, you know, you can take this process and apply it to any other finite element software that you may, you may use. Okay. Okay. So let's go through the six steps of how to run an FEA simulation. All right, step one is always to define the geometry, okay? And so to perform an FEA simulation, you need to have some kind of computer model um, for whatever you know, thing that you wanna run a simulation on, okay? And so in most cases, this is, come, this is gonna come in the form of some kind of CAD file. And so if you're familiar with SOLIDWORKS or you're familiar with um, CATIA, um, usually what happens is that, uh, or use the usual workflow is that you're gonna use SOLIDWORKS, you're gonna use CATIA, you're gonna build a CAD model or computer representation of your geometry, okay? And so it may look something like this, if it was a bridge, you know, if you're doing a beam, an I-beam, it might look something like that, okay? Um, and the geometry is important because, you know, it's, it's basically the subject of your simulation, you can think of it like that. Um, but kind of more mathematically, it sets the boundaries and it sets the shape. Um, and the geometry for the simulation itself, okay? Um, and so for example, you know, um, this may seem very, you know, elementary the way that I, I say it, but if you wanna find out, you know, if your bridge design, if it's gonna withstand the stresses of cars driving over it, the first step is to get a CAD model that defines your bridge geometry, okay? And this means that it has to have the right dimensions, it has to have the right uh, shapes and the, the right materials for the frame, okay? Um, so some FEA tools um, actually do have their own kind of built-in CAD software. Uh, we'll see that with Antis as well. So Antis has a couple CAD softwares that are inside it. But I would say for most cases, um, just because it's, you know, the, the features are a lot more robust, a lot of times the CAD model is built in a separate software. So it's going to be built in SolidWorks. It's going to be built in CATIA because those softwares are kind of more specialized and more kind of fully featured for doing that. And then after you build the, the geometry in SOLIDWORKS, then you import that model into the FEA system, okay? Uh, but first step is always to define the geometry. Okay, step two, material properties. And so now that we have the geometry, the next step is to say, you know, what our geometry is made out of, okay? And so if you have a bridge that's made out of steel, you know, that's gonna be very different than a bridge that's made out of plastic, right? And so making sure that you specify the correct materials uh, with the correct material properties. And so they have the same stiffness, the same Young modulus, uh, the right density, the right um, Poisson's ratio, you know, that's going to be important for an accurate simulation. Because okay? um, if you don't set the right material properties, you may set up everything else correctly, uh, but you're going to get a wrong result because the material properties are wrong. Okay. All right. And so, you know, for this class, we're going to start out with fairly simple materials. And so we're going to start out with simple linear materials where the only things you have to specify are things like the elastic modulus, the density and the Poisson's ratio, um, but there are a lot more complex materials out there. So if you're, especially if you're working with like a plastic, if you're working with a wood, okay? Um, the way those materials behave are very different. And so a lot of times you're gonna need a more complex material model. Things like an anisotropic material model, maybe a nonlinear material. Um, there's material models that's specialized for composites, okay? And so we'll go over that kind of later in the class, but. For now, we're going to stick to mostly this kind of simple linear materials. Uh, all right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, and so I'd say step one and step two are you know fairly straightforward. So you have to define the geometry and the material. This is when we're getting. This is when you're starting to get to kind of FEA specific stuff. Okay, and so the next step is a step that I like to call mesh. Okay. Um, and so when I say mesh, basically what I mean is to take your geometry and to kind of break it up into all these kind of simpler shapes, okay? And so visually, it almost kind of looks like you're putting a grid on top of your geometry. And that's, that's kind of where the name meshing comes from, okay? All right, and so the reason for this um, is that, you know, ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna be solving differential equations on our geometry, okay? Um, that's really hard to do when your geometry is very complex, but if you are doing it on kind of simple shapes like triangles, squares, rectangles, boxes, uh, pyramids, okay, it becomes a lot easier. And so uh, what you'll see is that you know the next in order to basically solve the equations and run the simulation, 
we have to break up our geometry into these kind of simple shapes, okay? Um, and that step is called mesh, okay? And so the good thing about, you know, about using ANSYS is that ANSYS will handle most of this for you. Um, you only have to specify just some kind of basic parameters. So you have to specify uh, what shape that you want. And so whether you want uh, pyramids or if you want bricks, okay? And you have to specify the size of the elements as well. Um, it's a lot more nuanced than that, and, and we'll get into you know meshing, advanced meshing, because you know meshing is actually a big part of, of this course. But that's essentially that's essentially the, uh, the process. So you know you have your geometry, you specify what types of shapes that you want, you specify the size, and then ANSYS will do its best to kind of make a mesh for you. Okay, and ideally you should get something that looks kind of like this, where you have you know you have obviously your geometry that's in the background, but you have a nice kind of even um, kind of uniform mesh um, underneath. Okay. All right. Um, so some popular shapes that we'll go over are things like triangles, quadrilaterals, um, tetrahedrons. And so a tetrahedron is, is just kind of a four-sided pyramid, okay? Um, or hexahedrons, which is a box, okay? Um, so meshing is often gonna be the most difficult part um, of, of any kind of uh, finite element analysis. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different ways to mesh and there's a lot of different ways where meshing can go wrong as well. So you know, we're gonna spend a, a pretty decent amount of time talking about meshing. What are some of the issues that can pop up and you know, how do you solve those, those kinds of issues, okay? And so to kind of understand meshing, you know, I, I, I like to draw this analogy with kind of how we understand image resolution, okay? And so when you're looking at an image online or you're, or you're taking pictures on your phone, you know, we kind of rate the quality of that image based on how many pixels are in that image, right? And so basically the more pixels that are there, the sharper the image is, is going to be, right, in, in general. And so meshing is kind of the same thing. And so uh, the more elements that you have um, in your mesh, the more accurate your simulation is going to be, uh, but it's also gonna make it more costly. As well, right? And so that's, that's kind of the analogy that we'll go with. I think we'll, we'll talk about meshing, I think sometime next week. Okay, next step is to apply boundary conditions. So boundary conditions, um, you know, if you if you take in uh, you know four thirty eight or five thirty eight, you know boundary conditions are um, basically a necessary step in order to solve any differential equation. Okay, uh, and, and FEA is no different. So FEA is we're basically solving differential equations, and so in, in order to get a proper solution, we have to apply boundary conditions on the on the simulation. Okay, um, so the good thing I think for FEA compared to like a straight up math class is that the boundary conditions are going to be a lot more. I would say um, tangible, okay? And so instead of, instead of um, specifying mathematical equations on a boundary, you would specify you know, um, how much load is being applied, right? And so you're gonna, you're gonna click on a surface in your, in your model and we're gonna say, this is, there's gonna be a hundred pound load on this, okay? Or you might specify something is that, you know, I have my geometry here and it's gonna be fixed to the wall right here. So this should be what we call a fixed support, okay? And that's gonna make sure that the deformation is gonna be zero there as well, okay? And so generally speaking, boundary conditions can be classified as either loads or constraints, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, we'll talk a lot more about the boundary conditions. This is kind of, you know, um, meshing, I would say, is, is generally more technically complicated, but you have to have kind of a good understanding of the physical problem to apply boundary conditions well as well, okay? Okay, so that's step four. Um, step five is to solve. Um, which sounds like a dumb step because you know we're trying to solve it this whole time, but you know that's that's actually the step that's called. Okay? Because after you after you make the mesh, after you apply the boundary conditions, um, what's happening internally inside the computer is that it's it's created this gigantic math problem. Okay? In particular, it's created this gigantic linear algebra problem. And so you know, you may be familiar with kind of this syntax right here: ax is equal to b. Okay, where a is some kind of uh, very large matrix. X is uh, the solution vector that you're looking for, and B is some kind of right-hand side vector, okay? Where this matrix A, okay, um, if you kind of remember from your linear algebra class, you know, you, you may be used to A being something like three by three, four by four, five by five, um, but for finite elements, you know, we literally create matrices that are, you know, probably millions by millions, and so it's not uncommon to have like, you know, a five million by five million matrix, right? So that means five million equations with five million unknowns, okay? And so that's, that, that's a fairly modest problem, I'd say as well, okay? And so you can see that, you know, a, a system of 5 million equations and 5 million unknowns is not really something practical that a human can solve unless you're some kind of psychopath, um, which there are out there, but, you know, most people are, are not. And so 
most of the times we, we rely on a computer to kind of help solve these for us. Okay. As for a computer, this is this is cake. Right? So you know you have five million by five million, the computer is like, no problem, boss. Let me get let me get that for you. Okay. Um, and so this is kind of where the computational step comes comes in. Okay? And the good thing is that you know, once you've kind of, you you kind of done most of the work of the simulation already, so you kind of worked hard, you produced a good mesh, you apply the boundary conditions, you made sure that they're accurate. This is when you can kind of hit solve and just kind of you know kick back and just wait for the computer to solve. And so there's really nothing you have to do here um, unless there's issues. And so that's you know then then you're gonna have to, have to have to go back and debug. Okay. And then the last step, of course, is to analyze your results. And so after the finite element, after the computer has kind of chunked through all the calculations, it's gonna show you the results. And so usually the results are kind of shown in this form right here. Okay. And so usually your results are gonna be shown in, in terms of a color contour. Um, or a heat map, you would say, okay? And so the way to kind of interpret this is that, you know, this right here, this is not the most exciting simulation because it's just a rectangular block, um, you know, but what he's done is he's basically run the simulation and he's, he's computed the effective strain, okay? And the way to kind of read this is that, you know, you kind of go by the color bar. And so from the color bar, you can see here that a color of red corresponds to an effective strain of 1.5. And so, you know, under the mesh and under the boundary conditions that you specified, um, this would have an effective strain of 1.5 in this area over here, okay? And you can go by the different numbers as well. And so, um, you know, and, uh, you can see from here, a color of green is an effective strain of 1.0. And so, you know, you have 1.0 strain over here um, and then everything kind of in between, okay? And so once the simulation is done and once you get your results, you know, you can kind of interpret the results from here, okay? And so some of, and so some of, the, some of the questions you may be answering is, you know, you might be interested in looking at um, the equivalent stress, and so you might be looking at, you know, how much uh, structural stress is, uh, is, is this geometry under, and is this going to fail, okay? Or you might be interested, you know, what's the deformation inside this, you know, how much deflection am I getting in this part of the, of the geometry, and you can get this from, from the simulation, okay? Um, and so that's, that's kind of how to read the, the results. Okay? And of course, there's, there's a lot that you can do in post-processing. Um, one thing that I, I'm hoping to change this semester is that I do want to have some some, some tutorials on how to do some expansive post-processing, because I think that is, that is important, um, but that'll probably come more towards the end. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so that's the finite element process. And so that's six steps. And so on Wednesday, you know, when we do our first activity, um, we're basically gonna go through these six steps. And so I'll basically be highlighting, you know, everything that we do in the software and how that relates to each of the steps that we talked about today. All right, any questions on, on this? Yeah. Oh, what are the numbers for next to the triangles and the squares? Uh, these ones right here? Underneath the marks. Yeah, so usually usually what uh, what happens, um, usually a lot of people are interested in, in what the maximum and minima um, are. And so usually uh, it's hard to see in this, it might be on the back side, but usually they mark the location of the maximum. So it looks like the maximum here might be 2.68 somewhere. And the minimum strain is 0 0.106. And so they usually put those shapes somewhere, somewhere on here. Yeah. And so there's a way in answers for you to specify the maximum as well. This, this actually just may be for uh, informational purposes. So sometimes uh, by default, Ant what ANSYS will do is that it'll make the color bar, it'll find the absolute maximum and set that to be red. It'll find the absolute minimum and set that to blue. But sometimes just for visual purposes, you may have a custom range. And so um, sometimes you might want to see, you know, this is actually the absolute maximum. So even though this is showing up as bright red right here, you know, the strain might actually be closer to 2.5 or something like that. Um, but he wanted to set the color bar from 0 to 1.5 just so that you can see the results in other cases as well. All right. Okay. And so how does FEA factor into design? And so that's kind of what this class is about. You know, how, how do we use computer... Um, computer applications for design, okay? Um, and so because of the nature, the digital nature of FEA, and because a lot of design is, is being done on computers now, especially in SOLIDWORKS, you know, it's kind of like a match made in heaven. So a lot of times, you know, throughout the design process, you know, say you're designing a part like this, right? Um, what the engineer will do is that, all right, you know, I have a design that I think looks good. Let me run an FEA on it to make sure that it's, you know, the part is still, you know, it's doing what I, what I want it to do, okay? And so it's kind of part, like just kind of a, an, it's almost like a like an essential part of the design process uh, now as well. Okay, and the idea is that you know by using the simulations, 
they reduce the need for any kind of physical testing, which um, saves them a lot of time. And money. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are at simulations, you should never just trust simulations. Okay? And so there should be some kind of physical testing that, that has to take place just to kind of make sure that everything that you did is, is, is good. Okay? There's some very, um, I would say arrogant people in the, in the FEA community that says, we don't need physical testing anymore. FEA technology has come so far um, and they usually get pelted with stones and tomatoes. You know, people don't like them generally, but you know. So, you know, I, even though we're gonna be focusing a lot on simulations and, and of course me being from a simulation background, I think it's, it's a great tool, but you know, if I have to be like honest with myself, it's never gonna fully replace physical testing. Okay? Cause we don't live in the digital world. We live in the real world. And so it doesn't matter how much digital testing you do, you want to make sure that whatever part of your design is going to be safe for real people in the real world. Okay. okay. All right. And one thing I want to stress to you know from today is that FEA, even though it's it's a really great tool, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with it. It's just a tool. Okay. And so I think some people, you know, they take a class like this and think, oh, ANSYS is really cool. You know, I can simulate all these things with it. And so people think like ANSYS is like God or something like that. So whatever ANSYS says must be correct, okay? Uh, but just like any tool that you might have in like your toolkit or maybe in a workshop, there are ways to use it well, and there's ways to misuse it as well, okay? And I think the dangerous thing for FEA is that sometimes if you run an FEA, you'll get results that, you know, when you first look at it, you're like, okay, yeah, that looks good. Um, but it may give you, you know, complete garbage results. And so there's a saying that we have in FEA and, com and computations in general, is that if you put garbage into an FEA tool, you're going to get garbage out. Okay? So garbage in, garbage out. Okay? And, but sometimes it's not immediately clear when you're getting garbage results. And so you know, part of this class is going to be, you know, how do you kind of interpret that? How do you kind of, you know, um, assess your results to make sure that what you're getting is accurate and fine. Okay. And no matter how good your simulation setup is, you know, FEA at the end of the day is only going to be an approximation of reality. Um, because reality, um, it's going to sound really, you know, reality is very, it's too complex to kind of solve in a computer, you know, no matter how complex your equations are, uh, no matter how sophisticated your models are, you know, there's just too many complexities in reality to really kind of, you know, effectively and truly accurately model it in a computer, okay? Um, and so there are, there are ways where we can get our approximations very close, but that's always kind of something to remember that simulations are just an approximation. Um, there's another saying, I don't have it here, but uh, um, there's a saying that um, all simulations are wrong, but some are useful, okay? And so, you know, your simulation, what that means is that your simulation is not going to perfectly recreate to the 16th decimal, you know, what the stress may be in your part, but it can get pretty dang close if you, if you set it up well, okay? Um, but, you know, that's something always to remember. And, you know, whenever you teach any kind of computational class, or you, you take computational class, you know, that's something to remember. Any questions on, on this? All right, so here's a course outline. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. And so, you know, I, I don't expect any of this to make sense right now, um, but this is kind of the plan that I have for the class. And so the green, in the green right there, that's kind of the bigger, I would say umbrella topics. And so we're gonna start with the foundational knowledge. Then we're gonna do FEA basics. Um, then we're gonna spend a decent amount of time on meshing, then advanced topics and uh, finish with verification and validation. Okay? And then in the yellow there, you can see kind of all of the, uh, um, all the subtopics within these kind of bigger topics. Okay? And so as we go through the semester, you know, this will make a lot more sense, but you know, I wanna show you that I do have a plan for this class. We're not just gonna do random shit every day. Okay? So I, I, this, is my, this is my plan, okay. Okay. And so, you know, we are, you know, part of, a part of this class is that we are gonna learn a little bit of, of background information and so, you know, I have, to, I have to have this slide because, you know, generally in an ANSYS class, people just want to do ANSYS, right? So they want to do ANSYS every day, all day, every day. Uh, but we have to learn some background information, okay? And the reason for that is that, you know, whenever you use a tool like ANSYS, you know, you have to know how to use it right. And, you know, knowing the background knowledge, knowing the background concepts, the background information will kind of help you, you know, use it well, okay? Um, and, you know, especially, especially, you know, because you guys are grad students, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to leave this class, you know, basically being an expert in FEA. Okay. And it's a responsibility basically as an expert 
to really understand and really just be honest with our tools. And so that's why we learn um, all the background information that we do. And so as an example, you know, for a vet, you know, there are procedural, I call them procedural things that you expect in them to do, uh, like being able to give shots to your animals and take blood samples, but you also expect them to know some kind of conceptual information, right? And so you also expect them to know, you know, why they're giving your animal shots, okay? So they're not just shooting up this random stuff into your, into your cat, okay? Mm -hmm. um, they should be able to tell you why your animal is sick and, you know, why and what to do. And if your pet is doing any kind of weird behavior, then you expect them to be able to know that as well. Okay, so with any kind of basically any kind of situation where you're considered an expert, you not only have to know kind of what to do, but kind of why you're doing it. So that's why we do we go over that information. Okay. okay, and so that was the kind of the introduction to the class. Um, a little bit longer than I thought, but that's okay. Um, so now from here, we're just going to go over the syllabus. So basically, all the administrative stuff for the class, and then I'll give you a brief tour of the course uh, website. Um, but are there any questions about the class overview or anything before I move on to that stuff? Um, if someone posted a question in chat, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the question in chat is, are we going to need to use additional tools like SolidWorks or MATLAB in this class? Uh, you will not. And so uh, I'm going to provide all the CAD files that you need for the course. Um, and so the only thing that you need is just, is just the answers. Okay, all right, so let's look at the syllabus. And so the syllabus is posted online. And so, you know, you can, uh, um, all this information is there, uh, but I thought I'd go over it together just so that we can all kind of discuss it. Okay. All right, first is office hours. And so my office is actually in this building. So it's in the CS building. It's on the fifth floor of this building. So CS 526, okay. And these are the times, okay. Um, so Monday is from three to four, Wednesday is from one to two, and Thursday is from 10 to 11, okay. I realized that, you know, especially for this class, I know a lot of you are working during the day. So probably literally none of these times will work for you. Uh, but I do have the option for Zoom as well. And so, um, um, and so if you're not able to attend in person, I do open up a Zoom room for each of these times. Um, and you can come to office hours during the um, via Zoom, okay? Um, and so uh, we, I have links for those on the course website, which I'll show you after that, okay? Um, but even then, you know, these are not the only times I'm available. And so um, I am available outside um, these hours as well. And so if you need, if you need to speak with me, um, you can also make an appointment. And so you can send me an email, just let me know, you know, say, hey, you know, I need to talk to you about something. I need some questions answered, uh, but I can't make it to your office hours. You know, can we set up an appointment? Uh, I'm always happy to do that, okay? Uh, so just let me know, because, you know, I know probably for, for you guys, these times are probably not gonna work out unless, you know, you attend on a break at work or something like that. Um, and so, you know, if you need an appointment, just, just let me know and, you know, we can, we can make that, okay? All right, so course, uh, course level learning objectives. That question in the chat? Okay. Okay, so course level learning objectives. And so, you know, in addition to the daily learning objectives, I have these um, learning objectives for the whole course, okay? Um, and so these are kind of the four guiding objectives that are, that are kind of organizing the whole course, okay? So I'm, I'm not gonna go through each of them just because, you know, they probably won't make too much sense now, but you know, just know that they're, they're there. Okay. All right, so deliverables. And so um, there are quite a few deliverables in this class. And so I, I, we are gonna do eight assignments. Um, and so each of those assignments are basically, an, an, I call them ANSYS activities, okay? So each of, those, each of those assignments, they're attached to basically an in-class kind of lab activity that we're gonna do, okay? And so each of those activities are gonna teach a different feature of ANSYS. And the idea is that, you know, when we do that, there's some in-class work that you can do. And then there is some additional work to do after that activity um, to kind of really kind of hammer home the concept from that activity, okay? um, And so uh, once you do, uh, once you finish those, then you can turn it in. So the, 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 uh, the format for that will be just basically a single PDF. Okay? We'll talk about it more on Wednesday because Wednesday is actually gonna be our first activity. Uh, and then besides that, there's one midterm project and a final project as well. Um, so for the activities, um, you know, I know it's, it's eight, eight is kind of a lot, especially with, you know, the activities. And so, you know, I, I do, I will drop the lowest uh, homework grade, so the lowest assignment grade. Uh, but again, you know, I, I designed those activities so that each one kind of teaches an important concept within the answers. And so, you know, none of those are going to be repeats of each other. And so you know, please do them all because they all, they, they all do teach important stuff or what I consider to be important for us, okay? 
Okay. Uh, I don't know why I have the third bullet point. There's no midterm exams. And so there's there, this class is just kind of purely project based. Okay. And so for the due dates, uh, my plan for the midterm project is for it to be due right before spring break. And so that's going to be Sunday, March 26th at 11.59 p.m. And the final report is going to be due on Monday, May 22nd at 11.59 p.m. And so that's going to be the Monday after finals. Okay. And so just because, you know, uh, for those of you that are taking kind of multiple fi uh, final exams, uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of uh, when you can turn it in. Okay. But because I pushed it so late, um, it's, it's hard for me to kind of push that back anymore um, just because I have to finish grading by the end of that week as well. And so, you know, I have this class and, and two other classes. And so, you know, that's kind of as late as I can push it. And so, you know, um, oh yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this so far? Um, I have one if no one in inside the classroom has one. Sure, go ahead, Ivan. Um, so uh, the midterm project, um, it's obviously gonna be cumulative, right? It's like, it's gonna, Yes. Contain information from the weeks beforehand. Right. Yes. It and, will. and and uh, regarding the final project, is that also a cumulative? So that yes. that project is going to contain everything uh, related to even things we learned in the first week. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So okay. you should be. Um, and, so the third bullet point. Those are for classes where I have multiple midterm um, exams, um, but I just I was kind of sloppy. I forgot to take it out. So yeah, there's one midterm, one final Sounds project. Good. They're both um, um, I have one more question. Um, sure. Do you offer extra credit at any point? Uh, will you offer extra credit at any point during the semester? I usually do not, uh, unless it's kind of a okay. special case. But uh, but it's just okay. it's just going to be these assignments, basically. Okay, sounds good. Um, someone posted a question in chat. Yep. Thanks. Um, that's a yeah. It seems like we don't need to attend class. Well, you don't need to be in person. Um, so I am going to be streaming. I am going to be streaming the uh, the lectures every day, um, and so you know, and that goes throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire semester. But I will say that for the ANSYS activities, those are going to be hands on in nature, and so you are and so you are going to be using ANSYS in class, um, and so it's 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 a lot easier for me to kind of help you out and debug your issues kind of when you're in the class. Um, I do I do sometimes come back to the Zoom and kind of help people that way, but it's it's a lot more difficult. Because I can't really see what you're what you're working on, or it's harder to see with the screen share, um, and just naturally, just you know, people in the class just kind of get my attention a lot more easy too. So, I would I would say you know, um, for the days we're just having a pure lecture, um, those are kind of the best days to attend virtually, just because you know there's there's nothing we're doing in class, um, and you're just basically taking notes. But on the on the days where we're doing activities, um, I do recommend that you come to class just so it's easier for me to help. Um, but you're but you're still free to to attend those virtually. All right, questions. How do we get ANSYS on our private computers? Are there instructions? So yes, I'm going to post instructions for that uh, probably tomorrow. Um, you basically just download it from the ANSYS website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Granted, you have a Windows computer. Okay, course grades. And so this is how the grades for the course are going to break down. So the, the homework assignments or the ANSYS activity is going to be 15%. The midterm project is going to be 40%. And the final project is going to be 45%. Okay. Um, and then based on how you score from all of those, I'm going to assign letter grades based on that scale. So I think that's a fairly standard scale. Okay. Um, and what I do too, so I haven't had to do this in a while, but what I do at the end of the semester is that I, I, I basically average everyone's final grade. And for, for a grad course, if the final grade is below an 80%, then I basically add points to everyone's grade until that average is, is 80%. Um, but I haven't had to do that for a while. I think last time I taught this class, I think the average was around 82, 83. And so there, there wasn't any need for that. But, you know, in the case that does happen, where the average is kind of in that C category, I just kind of boost everyone's grades. But I haven't had to do that for a while. Usually students have been doing pretty good. All right, textbook. And so I have, I have strong, um, maybe kind of a hot take on textbooks, but I think textbooks are run by the mafia, modern day mafia. So I never require textbooks for my courses. Um, so uh, what you'll see is that I'll post all basically all the material that you need for the course, all of my lecture notes, all of the activities, uh, all the tutorials, I'm going to post on Canvas, and so you'll have all those. Okay? Uh, but if you were interested in picking up a book for reference, then this is the book that I'm following for this course. Okay? It has a very descriptive title, so it's the Finite Element Simulations with ANSYS Workbench 2020. <laughs> you can't really get much more straightforward than that. Okay? Um, so 2020 was a while ago, that's just the one that I happened to get for free. 
um, before they uh, before they figured out I was basically stealing textbooks from them. So they haven't given me a new one. Um, but ANSYS hasn't really changed all that much in the, in the recent years. So um, that's the textbook that I'm using, but I know they've come out with a 2021, 2022. Uh, I don't know if the 2023 one is out yet, but you know those are all gonna be great references, okay? Uh, but again, you don't need it. And if you do plan on picking up the textbook, you know, try to find a cheap one. Um, you know, I always tell people don't pay full price for textbooks, it's, it's a freaking scam. So if you find a cheaper version that may be used, or you maybe you stumble across one, a, a download link when you're sailing the high seas, I would say, you know, that's probably your best option. This one's pretty good though. It's it's a it's a very straightforward textbook. I would say it's a good textbook. All right, course, uh, course website, Canvas. Okay, and so uh, we'll go, we'll tour the course website after this, but uh, basically any content that I make for the class, whether it be lecture notes, homework assignments, solutions, um, study guides, tutorials, basically anything that I make for the class, I'm gonna post it on Canvas. Okay? So the Canvas is kind of your first stop shop for kind of all these things, okay? Um, I'm also gonna make announcements on Canvas. And so if you're enrolled in the course and you're in the Canvas uh, course, um, it should automatically email you whenever I make an announcement, okay? Uh, one thing I use as well is, and I know a lot of you have already joined it, is I've made a Discord server for the class. Okay? Um, so this is something I originally did when we were all virtual, just because we you know we didn't have a physical classroom like this. Um, and so that was kind of a way to kind of recreate the classroom, and kind of, you know, uh, talk with your talk with your classmates. Okay? So if you're running into an issue with ANSYS um, and you need some help, um, and then you so you can you know post something on Discord and usually someone, usually someone will respond and kind of help you out then. Uh, I've had my students make memes of me, and so they make fun of my handwriting, and they make fun of the way like, the shirt that I'm wearing, and so that's that's fine too. Okay. Um, even though I made the server, I, I'm I'm usually not that active on it because it's I usually just mute those notifications. So it's really just you know it's really a place for you guys. Okay? Uh, but with that said, you know if if someone's asking a question and no one knows, uh, you can always tag me, um, and then I'll come in and, and answer the question. All right? And so the last the last bullet point here is important. So you know the Discord um, or the Discord account that I use for for this uh, server is my own personal account. And so you know um, I'm not going to say don't message me directly on Discord, but you know please try to save this for emergencies. And so you know I use that account you know to talk to you know I used to talk to my friend, I used to talk to my wife, uh, my sister. Uh, you know so when too many students kind of message me directly on Discord, it kind of you know it kind of kind of blurs that line between work and uh, work in personal life. And so um, if it's something of an emergency, you can message me on Discord. I'll usually respond faster on there. But if it's something that can be emailed to me, I would prefer you do that. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions uh, so far? Okay. All right. Course policies. And so I do accept late homeworks. Um, and so, you know, I know because you, know, you guys are grad students, there's a lot going on in your lives. And so if you're not able to finish an activity before the deadline, I still want you to do it, uh, but I do have to take off points from each day that it's late. Okay? And so my policy is that for each day that it's turned in after the deadline, I deduct 10% of the points. Okay? Um, and if for some reason the, the Canvas um, submission is not working, you can always scan it and email it to me as well. Okay? Uh, regrades, you know, I'm always happy to look at things again. And so if I grade your midterm project, final project, or, or any of the activities, um, and you feel like you deserve more points, um, I'm always happy to look at those. So just please let me know. Uh, but I do place a limit on this. And so, you know, whenever I return things to you, um, it usually is going to have some kind of comments or feedback on it. Maybe not so much for the activities because we do a lot of those, but for the midterm project, I'm definitely going to be giving you feedback. And so I want you to be reading those feedback on kind of a, a regular basis. And so, you know, it's not so useful to read feedback for something that happened like three months ago. So. You know, I want you to be kind of reading those comments on a timely basis. And then if there's something, if there's some issue with that, then you can come back and for a okay. So in other words, you know, if it's if it's finals week and you really need to bump in your grade, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard for me to go back and look at your midterm project because that happened, you know, literally like two or three months ago. And so, you know, I prefer to kind of deal with those kind of in the moment more so than. All right, so emails, um, I'm usually pretty fast with emails. And so I have my email open most of the day. Um, and so if you send me an email, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but it would help me out a lot if you put EGME 540 in the subject line, um, just so I know that the, the email is coming from this course, okay? Right. Okay, so last thing I have to talk about um, for this class, it's uh, 
usually usually not an issue, um, but you know we do have very strict policies on academic dishonesty. Okay, um, and so I, I think this this uh, this issue has kind of evolved recently because there's a, there's a, an AI tool out there that writes papers for you, um, and so you know if you're you know if you do use that or if you copy or anything like that, you know we have very strict. There's there's really not much room for negotiation. So at the very least, it's going to result as on a zero for that particular assignment, and for a lot of cases. You know, especially if it happens on like a midterm project or the final project, you know, um, it's going to result in F for the course. Okay, um, so it's very strict, and, and there's not there's not much room that we can do. But I will say this, and so you know, um, you, know you guys are all grad students, so you know you probably heard this before. But you know, if you're if you're cheating, you know that's that's basically taking away from you. Okay, and my goal for this class is for everyone to kind of leave the course feeling confident that they can use ANSYS at the professional level. So I, I want you guys to have that confidence. Um, and so, you know, the bottom line is that if you're not doing the assignments or you're copying or stuff like that, you're not really getting that information. Okay? And so I'll say that, you know, if you ever feel like, you know, you're struggling in the material or you feel like you're falling behind, you know, please just come talk to me first. Okay. Because uh, if you talk to me first before then, then we, there's a lot of things we can do. So you know, we can set up, we can set up sessions for us to, um, for me to catch you up. You know, we can set up an appointment to kind of catch you up on, on material. Um, you know, we can we can maybe move some deadlines around that, that work better with your schedule. Um, there's stuff that we can do kind of with the grading scheme. And so, you know, there's there's a lot. And, and you know, I, you know, um, for some of you that, I'm, you know, it, it may come off as you know, maybe not genuine, but, you know, I really do. I really do want everyone in this course to succeed, you know, and I really want everyone to learn the material well. And, you know, if you cheat, you know, at that point, there's nothing I can do. But if you come to me before then, I promise you, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to criticize you. That's not my job. My job is not to be a policeman or to kind of, you know, criticize people or laugh at people behind their back. My whole, my, my job here is to help you succeed. And, 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 I, and I really want to do that. So please just come talk to me if you're struggling. And I promise you, I'll do everything I can to help you. Okay. Right. Um, any questions on, on this? All right, last thing, last thing we'll talk about is the first homework. And so I know, I know quite a few of you have done these. I'm a little bit behind in answering the emails, um, but I want everyone just to introduce themselves. And so, you know, we're gonna be, you know, together for the next 16 weeks um, at this very late time slot where I'm like dying of hunger right now. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's always a lot more pleasant when I get to know you guys. Okay? And especially, you know, for, for grad students, I know a lot of you are coming in with kind of a, a specific thing that you wanna learn or you, or you kind of, you have a much better understanding of kind of what you want to get out of this course more so than like my undergrads. And so, you know, I, and I want to know that. And so, you know, if you want to email me, tell me about, you know, uh, what you're expecting from this course, you know, what you really want to learn, then I can factor that into the course. And so, you know, please, please tell me that. I'm always happy to, to listen um, and try to, and try to work those in as much as possible. Okay. Um, so you, you don't have to be too thorough with this. And so those questions here are just, you know, for a suggestion, if you're having trouble getting started, um, but I really do appreciate, I do really, I do really do enjoy reading all of these and, and I, and I respond individually to each one as well. Okay. And so if you get the email to me by Sunday, uh, January 29th, um, I give you full credit for it. Okay. And when you send me the email, don't forget to include EGME 540 in the subject. Um, and so that's uh, I have everything. a question, yep. Dr. Chan. Sure. Uh, with regards to homework zero, um, I haven't sent the email yet, but I'm wondering, are you gonna award the points um, at the past, at, uh, once the deadline has passed or are you awarding the points to Canvas once you read uh, each individual email and reply? I, I, I give the points right when I read it basically. Okay. That kind of helps with, uh, I used to do it where I wait to the end, but that uh, it was a little bit, it took a little bit too long just to go back in my inbox. So yeah, now you I have to make a list. Exactly, exactly, yeah. All right, then should. Thank you. Yep. Um, so some of you might be asking, you know, is it is it required for you to take some kind of FEA course before this? Um, it's not required. And so I'm, I'm teaching this course with kind of the expectation that, you know, some people may have seen some FEA, uh, but a lot of people are seeing FEA for the first time. And so we're going to be building up basically everything, all the basics from, from scratch. Okay. All right. So before you guys go, I do want to show you guys the website. I know some of you, some of you have been my students before, so you kind of know how to navigate this, but I did want to show you. Okay. All right. So when you go to Canvas, this is kind of what you'll see. Um, and so you'll see kind of some basic information about me, about the class times, the location, 
a little bit about the description. Here is the syllabus, okay? Um, and so a lot of the important information on the website is actually, if you, if you kind of scroll down on the homepage. So the first thing that you'll see here is the Zoom links. Okay? And so if you want to attend the lecture virtually, you would click on this top link right here. Okay? And then, um, yeah, the links for the office hours are here as well. Okay? And if you want to join the Discord server, that link is here too. Okay? Um, but I would say kind of you, probably where you're going to spend most of your time on the website is on this part right here, which I call the course outline. Okay? And so from here, you can see kind of a week by week breakdown of everything that we're going to cover in this course. And so as we go through the course, these links are going to become clickable. And so the only one that's active right now is week one, because that's all where we're at. Okay? And so if you click on the link, you'll see kind of a description of what we'll learn this week, some learning objectives. Um, the lecture recordings will be here. So I think that's kind of a, you know, for those of you looking to view the lectures again, this is where it's going to be. Okay. And so I post those kind of on a week by week basis. So usually the recordings are, are posted the next day. Um, because it's, it's late and I'm, I'm hungry and I'm, I wanna go see my wife after this. So usually the first thing I take care of in the morning is posting the recordings from the previous day, okay? And so by tomorrow at lunchtime, this link should be clickable right here and you should be able to view this lecture again, okay? Any assignments um, that I have are gonna be here as well. So you can click on those and any files for the week. So any kind of lecture notes, any kind of CAD files that we need for the activities, um, they're gonna be posted here as, as well, okay? Okay. Um, all right, so that's the website. And so I want to make sure I kind of show you that. Um, specifically for this class, let me just show you very quickly how to download ANSYS. And so I'll, I'll send instructions for this tomorrow. Um, but for our first activity for Wednesday, you should have ANSYS installed if you're going to be attending virtually. And so what I usually do is I just Google search. So I said download ANSYS student. Okay. Um, and it should be the first link that you see here. And so if you click on this, um, then what you're downloading here is, is this um, software right here, ANSYS Student. Okay. So you click on this, pre-download now, and you click on this. And so it is a, um, it is a fairly hefty file, so it is, it is very large, uh, but you can download that on your computer and install it uh, before you begin. But I'll, I'll send instructions for this tomorrow as well, just so that you can, uh, you can download. Um, all right, and so that's uh, that's about everything I have for the course. Um, any final questions before we wrap it up for today? Yeah. So for the projects, like the midterm and the final. Yep. How 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 much how much of a time frame do you have? Do you uh, so I'll post the midterm project a month before, so we have a month for the midterm project, and then I'll post the final project basically right after you turn in the midterm project. So the final project will be about five weeks to do that. All right, so that's all that's all I have planned for today. Um, so thank you guys for coming today and, and welcome again to the course. Um, I'll stick around for a bit after if you have some questions, but if not, I will see you on Wednesday for our first um, activity. Right, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, Ivan. Have a good night. Thank you for everything, sir. Yep. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's uh, that's one option. So, um, so the you have to complete so the twenty-seven or thirty units are and so six of those units. Uh, yeah, well, so that's one option. So you do a graduate project that'll take basically six units of coursework, um, and uh, and you don't have to do the comprehensive. Units. So that's that's kind of a big reason why most students take that. So what so what that entails usually is that you usually find a faculty advisor. I uh, and they have you work on the project. So every advisor, every advisor is different in how they do it. 
So some advisors will have something that's already kind of going on. But some advisors will also kind of um, kind of go through a process. So I know so for my students, if you're working on thesis, I'd have you do kind of a search in the future. So I'd say basically, these are the tools that I have. So Advances, I have other software. And this is my expertise. So this, that's kind of the area that I'm in. So I kind of leave it up to you to look at the literature and see you know, what are the most interesting uh, topics out there. And then, you know, have you got a little bit of like, talk and we'll form a part of it. Is that something that I start taking? And then I want to start changing my The sooner the better. So the uh, so the usual time frame for a project is And so you start, yeah, like, and so you, you, you look at, you know, when you kind of plan to do it, and then kind of think of one year before that. Yeah. Yeah. And so for some, but some faculty might want longer. So I know for some faculty that, that have to want to make it work. Um, so it really depends on, like, a lot of it really depends on the faculty. Yeah. Um, so I would go, I would, I would first be kind of like, you know, who's, who's the research area that you're interested in? And then kind of talk to them and say, you know, hey, you know, the grad student here, we can do a project or a thesis, you know, do you have time? Do you have time? So you the, the other option is that instead of doing, you don't, you don't have to do a project. Or the so. Exactly. So, so instead of taking those six units for a project or thesis, you just take two more classes. Um, and then the difference for that is that instead, because at the end of a thesis or project, you have to write a report. So it's a fairly, it's a fairly extensive report. Yeah. So it's like anywhere between 60 and 80 pages. And you have to present your report. Um, so, we, so we basically say like, that's enough stress for one student. So that's, that's all good. But if you take, if you go the courses route, you take nine courses or 10 courses or whatever, how much it is, then you take what's called a comprehensive. Okay. So it's kind of one big exam that you, you get to choose which courses that you felt was the strongest. And then you basically take one more exam in those areas just to make just to kind of confirm that you kind of mastered it all. And then you pass that exam. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate the info. That's our like okay. it's our first semester back in. So yeah, I, I, I think like, I may as well ask and see where yeah. where I can go with it. No, for sure, for sure. To start earlier. For, for sure. Whatever, so. Yeah. And you know, it may not maybe you won't be able to start this semester, but if you start the conversation now, mm -hmm. then the then the faculty can be like, you know, I have an opening maybe for. Uh, after yeah. the summer, yeah, something like that. Then, yeah. then you're kind of like first in line. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey. So wait. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Am I still able to get in? Or? Yeah. So so um so it depends on how many people are waiting. Yeah. What, you know, what what position you're on the waiting? I'm uh, two. Okay. Yeah. So so for this class, we're we're kind of limited just by how many seats we have here. Yeah. And so even though I know a lot of people will be attending virtually, I mean by yeah. fire codes we have to we can't exceed the capacity. Okay. And so uh, I don't know how many seats were defaulted on here, but usually what I do, especially for grad students, because I know we don't, we don't have that many offerings for, for grad classes, mm -hmm. what I do is that at the end of the first week, I see how many students are on the wait list, and if the room can accommodate that, then I just add everyone. Okay, yeah. so wait till the end of the week. Exactly. Yeah, because some students might drop out, you know, they might come to class and say, sure, so I didn't see anything. So, oh. okay. That's brutal. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I get a lot of uh, evaluations. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so, by the way, do you know someone named Kamal Khan? I do. Yeah. Uh, I seen him last year. Yeah. yeah. He told me to tell you to say Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I work with, it. he's doing good. It's yeah. Good. Good. I work with him. So, see him every day. I have to live with him. <laughs> he's fun. I, uh, yeah. Tell him, tell him I said that. Okay. I will do. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for this. Yeah. And what, and what was your name? Oh, uh, Trevor. Trevor. I see. Yeah. I'm kind of sick, so I don't want to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's good to meet you. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I'll see you uh, Wednesday. Then. Yeah. See you Wednesday, please. Okay. Hey, guys. What's up? Uh, just wanted to make sure that what about those oh, eight activities? Like, are those in class activities? Yes. Or yeah. So those are going to do that. Like, one there, there's, uh, there's an in class component to that. So, usually, how those work. So, Wednesday is going to be a bit different because it's our first time doing this. Uh -huh. So, I'll do a little bit more hand holding here. But usually I spend usually the first 30, 40 minutes like kind of teaching you the new feature analysis. And then there's some kind of stuff that you do on your own. Right. But what if like what if I'm attending it online? You can still you can still do that. Um, it's still possible, but you would have to, of course, run the answers on your own. So uh, we'll have to submit that activity that day only. No, no. So the activities are due a week, oh, a week after. Okay. Yeah. So that's for all the in-class stuff and all the and all the stuff that you mm -hmm. do. The assignment in class itself, right? Uh, like if you're really fast, if you're really fast, you can do everything in class. But usually, most be about like 60 70 percent in class, and then they just kind of finish up the rest. Yeah, like on these computers. Mm -hmm. So, having been that 
Yes, right. Yeah, can we use the computers after the class? Like, yeah, you can. Rose, oh, yeah. Rose. We can sit here after the class, right? Yeah, I mean, check, so, so technically, I, if I'm if I'm leaving, I have to pick everyone up. But you guys are <laughs> adults, but you guys are adults, so I usually I just let people stay with after. So the only thing is that when you leave, you have to turn off the lights and just close the door. So the door should lock on its own. You just have to make sure that you just close the door. So, yeah, but if that door is open tomorrow. And, and the security guard comes in, I get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, but, I'm, but I've never had an issue with that, especially with grad students. So as long as you guys just make sure to close the door and you know, don't steal anything, of course, then, <laughs> um, then that's the solution. Because I know, because I know for a lot of people, I know some people are learning Macs. And so you know, there's not really a lot of options yeah. who are finding homes. So that's why I think Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are you guys names? Uh, Amarji. How are you? Yeah. I'm Kelvin. Kelvin, nice I to meet you. I got your recommendation from BJ. Do you know him? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. So okay. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to learn from you. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, DJ was great. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Prem? Second? Prem. Oh. Uh, and you're taking your class? She's like, I'll, I'll go in any class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just in plan. Just in plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. I see. <laughs> I'm going to stick to Prem. I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. I, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad they like my class. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, guys. Good night. Yep. See you Wednesday.